What is going on everybody? It's Metagosis Perfectionellus. Welcome to my new playlist on organic chemistry. The chemistry of carbon and hydrocarbons. But why the flip? Is it carbon? Why not any other element? The periodic table has many. Why carbon? Let's try sodium. Sodium is a failure. Sodium cannot make another bond with sodium, but carbon can. Okay, Minicosis, so you got me with the first group and the second group in the periodic table. But how about chlorine? Because chlorine can make a bond with another chlorine. Yes, but it's just one bond. However, carbon can make four bonds with others, just like this. Giving us more variety and more versatility in the organic compounds. So organic chemistry is largely the chemistry of carbon. Smash that like button and let's get started. This is my organic chemistry playlist and it's part of many playlists for the MCAT exam, the DAT exam, the NEAT exam, etc. This organic chemistry playlist has many videos. Today we are in video number one, but later we'll talk about all these doozy topics in addition to alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, enols, enolates, phenols, carboxylic acids, and the carboxylic acid derivatives, uh, namely esters, amides, anhydrides. So what are we talking about today? Organic compounds versus inorganic compounds molecular formula versus structural formula versus condensed structural formula versus the skeletal structure, the backbone, the bond-like notation, alkanes versus alkenes versus alkynes. Alkanes have a single bond between carbon and carbon, alkenes have double bond between carbon and carbon, and alkynes have triple bond between carbon and carbon. Quick note, the alkanes have single bond, the single bond is the longest, but it's also the weakest. How about the double bond? Well, it is shorter than the single bond, but stronger. And as for the triple bond, it is the shortest, but the strongest. Then we'll talk about the famous functional groups, the distinction among primary carbon, secondary carbon, tertiary carbon, quaternary carbon, and the distinction among alpha carbon, beta carbon, gamma carbon, etc. The difference between oxidation and reduction, what's the difference between the nucleophile and the electrophile, and then how to calculate the formal charge, and some famous reactions that you should never miss on your exam, because these are just giveaways. First, you need to know the following periodic table elements by heart. First, hydrogen, then carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, under chlorine, there is bromine and there is iodine. Electronegativity increases as you go up and to the right, making fluorine the most electronegative. Size increases as you go down and to the left. So chlorine is bigger than fluorine, bromine is bigger than chlorine, and iodine is bigger than bromine. What do you mean by saying that fluorine is the most electronegative? It means that fluorine is happy and satisfied by the surrounding negative electrons. It is happy with its own negativity. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon. Carbon is element number six in the periodic table, meaning it has uh, six electrons in total. The first two electrons in, in the first electron shell. I said shell, not subshell. And then the last four electrons will be in the valence electron shell. The two electrons here are in 1s2 subshell. As of these four electrons, they are 2s2 and then 2p2. 2 in 2s and two electrons in 2p. If you want to draw 1s2, you can draw it like this with two electrons with opposite spin, but then you ignore this in organic chemistry. We'll focus on these, and that will be a huge topic coming later, which is sp3 hybridization versus sp2 hybridization versus sp hybridization. Let's compare between organic compounds and inorganic compounds. Solubility. Organic compounds are mostly water insoluble. Who's gonna dissolve them then? Something organic, just like them. For example, benzene. As for inorganic compounds, they are mostly water soluble. Think of sodium chloride, for instance. Boiling points and melting points. Relatively speaking, organic compounds have lower melting points or boiling points compared to, compared to their inorganic counterparts. Inflammability. Organic compounds are mostly inflammable, but inorganic mostly non-inflammable. Odor. Organic compounds have lovely odors, many of them, vanilla, cinnamon, and others are indeed organic compounds. And why do you think the aromatic organic compounds are called aromatic? Because they are smelly. They have distinctive odors. 
Inorganic ones, mostly odorless. Electrical conductivity. Organic compounds are mostly non-ionizable, and that's why they are non-electrolytic. But inorganic compounds, many are ionizable and therefore electrolytic. Again, think of something half positive like this and half negative. Is this ionizable? Yup, electrolytic. Some are more electrolytic than others, of course. Chemical composition. Organic compounds are mainly made of carbon elements. Inorganic, other elements, let's say I have sodium, I have chlorine, iodine, magnesium, potassium, and sometimes carbon. Chemical bonds, organic compounds, covalent or molecular bonds. Inorganic could be covalent, could be ionic. Reaction rates, since the reactions here are happening between molecules, they are slower. But here the reactions are mostly between ions, so they are faster. These ions can dissociate very quickly and react very quickly. Isomerization is very common in organic compounds. In organic compounds, we do not see it for the most part. Polymerization organic compounds do make polymers. In organic compounds, do not. What does poly mean? It means many, and mere means piece. So many pieces bound to one another. Plastic is one example. Organic compounds or carbon land could be hydrocarbons, which means only hydrogens and carbons, just like this. For example, here are two carbons, and then we have six hydrogens, just like this. And this is what? Hydrocarbon, because I only have hydrogens and carbons. But I could have other atoms called heteroatoms, something else besides hydrogen and carbon. This could be oxygen or could be nitrogen. Carbon is so versatile. Why? Because carbon atoms can bind to one another or to other elements with different types of bonds. Could be single bonds, could be double bonds like this one, or could be triple bonds just like this one. Carbon atoms can also bind to each other in different forms, such as a chain or a cycle. The chain could be a straight chain. Look at the carbons here, straight chain. How about branched? Oh, look at this. Here's a straight chain, but I have a branch. Now, if you have watched my biochemistry videos, can you remind me what were the branched chain amino acids? Let me know down below in the comments. Hydrocarbons, hydrogens, and carbons could be aliphatic, which means no benzene ring, or aromatic, which means we do have benzene rings. The aliphatic could be an open chain, just like this, or saturated cyclic just like this. What do you mean by saturated? I mean saturated with hydrogen. There is nothing but carbon-carbon single bonds and hydrogens. So here is a bond between one carbon and the next carbon, and then the rest is two hydrogens here, and I have two hydrogens there. Why two? Because carbon makes four bonds in total. So for this carbon atom, here's one, two, three, and four bonds. For this carbon atom, here's one, two, three and four bonds and the same thing for the rest of this and this is a cyclic alkane how many carbons one two three four and five this is cyclopentane because penta means five as for the aliphatic open chain they could be saturated whenever you hear the word saturated think of saturated with hydrogen which means i have nothing else but single bonds between carbons and the rest is hydrogen. How about unsaturated? They have less hydrogen than they can. Look at this. This carbon is connected with three hydrogens. But look at this carbon. It's connected with only two hydrogens because I gotta preserve one for, for my double bond. So it has less hydrogen than this. If you have less hydrogen, you're unsaturated with hydrogen. But if you're saturated, it means you're saturated with hydrogen to the fullest. Can you name these lovely compounds? Let's try this. The first one is the benzene, and you can draw it like this, or you can draw it like this. Notice that it ends in ene, just like alkene, which reminds me of the double bonds. Is this aliphatic or aromatic? Of course, aromatic. How about this one, fluorobenzene, and this, chlorobenzene. This one, bromobenzene. This one, iodobenzene. And this one, you can call it hydroxybenzene, or better, phenol. How about this? Methyl benzene, or better, toluene. And this, remember COOH? This is a carboxylic acid group. Carboxylic acid plus benzene together is benzoic acid. And here are the names. Please pause and review. Here is the molecular formula. Four carbons, ten hydrogens. C4H10. If you break this down, this is carbon and this is hydrogen. Suppose that 4 is the N, and therefore the relationship is N is 4, 
2n will be 8, 2n plus 2 will be 10, just like that. When your formula is cn h 2n plus 2, this is an alkane. All of them are single bonds, as you see here. So can I open this up? Yes, and this is called Kekul structure of formula or Lewis structure. Of course, lovely scientists always argue with one another about who discovered this formula first. One of the oldest tricks in the book. I don't know what I'm talking about. Condensed structure formula is more condensed than this. So let's make the CH3, and then I have CH2, and then CH2 again. So it's CH2 times 2. And then the last one is CH3. This is called condensed structural formula. Okay? The last one is the skeletal structure or the bond line notation. Since this is hydrocarbon and hydrocarbons are always implied, we can just do these lines like this, like a backbone of hydrocarbons. Each one of this is a carbon. So here's one carbon. Here's the second carbon when you stop and then you go down like this. This becomes the third carbon and you go up like this this becomes the fourth carbon. You do not have to draw the dots. I'm just trying to help you understand where did this come from. So the line is not the carbons. The lines are the covalent bonds. The dots are the carbons. Okay, if the dots are the carbons, where are the hydrogens then? They are hidden. They are implied. So this one will have three hydrogens, just like this. And this one will have two hydrogens, two hydrogens, three hydrogens. Alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. Let's focus on this carbon. Here is a bond, here is a bond. Carbon makes four, so here is three, and here is four. Amazing. How many do you have? I have four groups. One, two, three, and four. So you draw what you saw. One, two, three, four. You put S, P, P, P. Multiply them together, you get S, P to the third power, or SP3 hybridized. But try your luck here. Look at this carbon. Here's one bond, second bond, third bond, which means there is a hydrogen hidden here. Let's count the groups. Here's one group, here is one group, and here is one group. So all of them are three. You draw what you saw like this. Three dashes, S times P times P. Multiply them together. It is SP to the second power or SP2 hybridized. As for this carbon, I have one bond, two bond, three bond, four bonds, which means there are no hydrogens here. How many groups? Here's the first group, here's the second group. Draw what you saw, two groups. S times P is SP hybridized, and this is the easiest trick to remember them on your exam. Why are these like this? Is another topic for an upcoming video titled SP hybridization. What's the name of this? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six. All of them are single bonds. This is a hexane, which is a type of alkane. How about this? One, two, three, four, five, six. Hydrogens are hidden. It's the same molecule. It is also hexane. And this, here's the first carbon. Here is the second carbon. Here's the third carbon. Here's the fourth carbon. Fifth and sixth carbon. Guess what? It's the same hexane. How about this weird thing right here? Here is my first carbon. This is a triple bond. So this is second carbon, third carbon, and fourth carbon. How many carbons do you have? You have four. The word for four in organic chemistry is but. And since you have a triple bond between two and three, it is but ein. And two and three, which one is the lowest number? The lower is 2, so you write 2 butyne. To emphasize that the triple bond is between the second carbon and the third carbon. We will learn more about the IUPAC naming system in the next video. You will find it already in my organic chemistry playlist. The famous functional groups for your exam. First, remember your water, which is H-O-H. Remove this H, replace it with a hydrocarbon chain or the rest of the chain, whatever that is and you get an alcohol group. Modify this into COOH, that's a carboxylic acid. What are the derivatives of the carboxylic acids? Esters, amides, and hydrides. What's the aldehyde? COH or CHO. Ketone groups, CO, but instead of the H, we have another chain. A chain on this side and a chain on that side. Aldehydes end in L, ketones end in O, alcohols end in OL, Carboxylic acids end in oic acid, esters end in oate, amides end in amide, anhydrides, the name ends in oic acid, because anhydrides result from condensation of two carboxylic acids, oic 
anhydride. An means no or removal, hydro means water. Because when you condensate or you condense two carboxylic acids together, water is gonna leave the chat and this will be an anhydride, no water. Esters, and instead of COOH, it is COOR. I replace the OH with OR. That's why ester is a carboxylic acid derivatives. I'm derived from almost the same formula. Look at this, OH replaced with OR. The rest is history. How about amide? Instead of OH, put NH2. Okie dokie. So amides are also carboxylic acids derivatives. The word am or ami reminds me of amino. So think of nitrogen. Look at this AMI. Think of nitrogen. Okay, uh, let's tweak it a little. Amine. Oh, it's nitrogen, but it's double bonded to carbon. Carbon types. Look at this. Oh, CH3 is called methyl. All right, so this is just the methyl carbon. All right. How about primary carbon versus secondary carbon versus tertiary carbon? Easy. If the carbon is communicating with only one other carbon, it's primary carbon. If the carbon communicates with two other carbons, it's a secondary carbon. If a carbon communicates with three other carbons, it's a tertiary carbon. Let's practice. Look at this carbon right here. It's a carbon that communicates with only one carbon. So this carbon right here is primary carbon. How about you, this carbon? Well, I, as a carbon, I connect with this carbon on this side and this carbon on that side. I connect with two, I am a secondary carbon. How about this doozy carbon right here? Let's think about it. I'll give you a moment to think about that. Okay, I, as a carbon, I connect to one carbon, second one, and third one, so I am a tertiary carbon. As for this carbon right here, it communicates with one, two, three, and four, so this is a quaternary carbon. Primary carbons with this color, secondary carbons with the yellow color, tertiary carbon with the orange color, and the quaternary carbon with the green color. Pause and review. How about this carbon right here? It communicates only with one, so it's a primary carbon. And if you have a group that's bonded to a primary carbon, we call it primary leaving group. Let's say that we have a leaving group attached to the secondary carbon, then this will be called secondary leaving group. Forget the leaving group, let's make this OH, which is an alcohol group. If the OH is attached to a primary leaving group, this will be called primary alcohol. If the OH is attached to a secondary leaving group, it will be called secondary alcohol. The same story applies for the positive carbocation. This positive is on a primary carbon because this carbon is attached to only one other carbon. So it's called primary carbo, carbon, cation, positive charge. This one, okay, look at this carbon. One carbon here, one carbon there. It's a secondary carbon, so this is a secondary carbocation. How about this? One, two, and three. It's a tertiary carbon, so this is a tertiary carbocation. Why is this positively charged? For this, you need to calculate the formal charge. Let's just draw a carbon, and let's draw the remaining hydrogens. In this case, only two hydrogens remain. Okay, to get the formal charge, first you write down the number of bonds or the number of valence electrons that you expected minus what you actually found in reality. Let's look at carbon. Carbon should make four bonds, correct? Yes, it should make four bonds. Let's look at what actually happened in reality. When I looked, I found one, two, and three. I only found three. So four minus three equals positive one, hence a positive one charge on this carbocation. And this is how to calculate the formal charge. What you expected minus what you found. You can try it again here. Carbon should make four. This is what I expected. Look, in reality here, it's one, two, only three bonds. Only three valence electrons, so four minus three is positive one. Positive one charge. Carbocation. Look at this OH. It's on a primary carbon, so it's a primary alcohol. This OH, this hydroxy, is on a secondary carbon, so it's a secondary alcohol. And this is a tertiary alcohol because the OH belongs to a tertiary carbon, which is a carbon connected to three other carbons. Now, please do not confuse primary carbon, secondary carbon, tertiary carbon with alpha carbon, beta carbon, and gamma carbon because they are two different systems. You see this? This is called the carbonyl, which is carbon double bonded to oxygen. We saw this in the aldehydes, in ketones, in carboxylic acids, and esters, and amides, and anhydrides. This carbon of the carbonyl is ground zero, okay? 
next to it is carbon alpha or the alpha carbon and then the beta carbon the gamma carbon etc here are the famous functional groups again this is not a comprehensive list but these are the most important ones for your exam Another important distinction is carbonyl versus carbonyl. Carbonyl, it's an alcohol group. Here's the R, rest of the chain, OH, alcohol group. But carbonyl is carbon double bonded to oxygen, not carbon single bonded to OH. Aldehydes look like this, COH, but ketones look like CO, and then instead of the H, I have another chain. Aldehydes end in L, ketones end in own. Here is the carbonyl, which is found in aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, and the derivatives of the carboxylic acids, which are esters, amides, anhydrides. Since I have a rest of the chain here, alkyl chain here, this is a ketone. Do you remember the periodic table? Yes, I had carbon, followed by nitrogen, then oxygen, then fluorine. And electronegativity increases this way, meaning oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Oxygen loves the negativity more than carbon. So the negative electrons will be attracted more towards the oxygen and away from the carbon. Creating what? Creating a dipole. And we draw the arrow like this. The head of the arrow is the negativity. And this plus sign is for the partially positive. Partially negative oxygen and partially positive carbon. Now imagine that we have something negative. Let's say a nucleophile, which is negative. Nucleophile is negative. Of course, the negative will be attracted to the partially positive carbon of the carbonyl group. Again, what are the functional groups that contain this carbonyl, which is carbon double bonded to oxygen? You find this in aldehydes, you find this carbonyl in ketones, you find it in carboxylic acids and the derivatives of the carboxylic acids, which are esters, amides, anhydrides. In this situation, the oxygen is becoming partially negative and the carbon is becoming partially positive due to electronegativity difference. You see this D-glucose? Oh, C-H-O. Oh, this is an aldehyde. Yes, aldehyde group could exist on carbon number one, the first carbon in the chain. However, look at D-fructose, which is a ketone. Oh, look at this carbonyl. That's a ketone because here is a, I have an alkyl group. Here's an R and here's an R. Rest of the chain, rest of the chain on both sides. That's a ketone. Ketone carbonyl can never be on the first carbon. Carbon two, yeah, maybe. Three, it can happen, but never on the first carbon. Next, nucleophiles versus electrophiles. Remember, nucleophiles are negative and electrophiles are positive. Why are nucleophiles negative? Because they have negative electrons. Excess pair of negative electrons. This pair will go from the negative to the positive because the negative is attracted to the positive. The arrow is always going from the nucleophile to the electrophile, which means the electrons are always going from the negative nucleophile to the positive electrophile. Organic chemistry reactions could be divided mainly into two categories, oxidation reduction reactions and nucleophile electrophile reactions. Oxidation reduction, what is oxidation? Oxidation in chemistry could mean one of three things, gain of oxygen or gain of a bond to oxygen, loss of hydrogen or loss of negative electrons. Reduction is the opposite, loss of oxygen. Oh yeah, because when you gain oxygen, you are oxidized, but when you lose it, you are reduced. It could be gain of hydrogen or gain of negative electrons. Next, nucleophiles versus electrophiles. Look at this arrow, it means what? It means that the electrons are moving from the nucleophile to the electrophile. The electrons are moving from the tail of the arrow to the head of the arrow. When the arrow is complete like this, it means two electrons or one pair of electrons is moving. But when it's half an arrow or a fish hook like this, it means a lone electron, only one electron, not a pair, but one electron is moving. Why do we call them electrophiles and why do we call them nucleophiles? First, let's go back to general chemistry. Remember that the nucleus is positive and the electrons around it are negative. If I say I love Sarah, it means that I am Sarah-phile, a lover of Sarah. So let's say that I am negative. If I am negative, I'll be attracted to the positive nucleus. I am a nucleus lover, seeking the positive nucleus. If you seek the positive nucleus, you're a nucleus lover, nucleophile. You're negative, 
but you love the positive nucleus. That's why they're called nucleophile. Conversely, if you're electrophile, it means that you are positive but attracted to the negative electrons. When you're attracted to the negative electrons, you're electrophilic. Mnemonic to keep it easy. Nucleophiles are negatives. Conversely, electrophiles are positive. The negativity is here because the electrons are at the nucleophile. Then the electrons will move from the nucleophile by being attracted to the electrophile. And this is called a backside attack. When you see a complete arrow like this, it means that the pair of the electrons are moving. What's the result? The result is that I'll use this pair of electrons, which is two electrons in total, to make a new single covalent bond between the electrophile and the nucleophile. And this is called coordinate covalent bond. Okay, I understand that it's a covalent bond, but why coordinate? Because both of these electrons that are making the bond here came from only one atom or one group. In this case, it came solely from the nucleophile. This pair of electrons did not come from the electrophile at all. Both came from the nucleophile coordinate. Here is lovely atom, here is another atom. Who has the electrons? B. Who has the negativity? Also B. So B will attack A. Always the nucleophile is attacking the electrophile. Nucleophile is negative. Why is this negative? Because it has an extra pair of electrons. Why is this positive? It does not have an extra pair of electrons. So the negative attacks the positive. Nucleophilic attack means the nucleophile attacks the electrophile. And then what? Use those two electrons to make a new covalent bond between A and B, between the electrophile and the nucleophile. Keep this idea in mind because we're coming back to this part. Acids versus bases. If you have watched my general chemistry playlist, we have said that we have three definitions of acids. The Arrhenius definition, an acid is a substance that yields protons. Another definition, Bronsted-Lowry, is the acid is a proton donor. The lowest definition is that the acid is an acceptor of electrons. The lowest acid is an acceptor of electrons. Conversely, the base is the exact opposite. It yields the negative OH when dissolved in water. It's a proton acceptor, not donor. And the base is an electron pair donor, not an electron pair acceptor. The lowest acid is an acceptor of electrons, but the lowest base is donor of electrons. And we're back to the same slide. We just said that the lowest acid is an acceptor of electrons and the lowest base is a donor of electrons. Amazing. So this is the donor of electrons. It has an extra pair to donate. This is the donor of electrons. This is the lowest base. How about the A? The A will accept the electrons. It's a lowest acid because it accepts electrons. Cool. So this is the lowest acid and this is the lowest base. But also, this is the electrophile and this is the nucleophile. Oh, therefore, a good nucleophile is usually a good base. And the electrophile is usually an acid. How do I remember this? It's a Medicosis meticulous mnemonic. You just write down the word Biden. And let me tell you what this means. It's an acronym. The base, according to Lewis, is a donor of electrons. And it's also a nucleophile negative. These acid-base equations are crucial. You need to know them by heart before you start organic chemistry. I've talked about them in detail in my general chemistry playlist. Don't forget that if I have a strong acid, it will have higher Ka but lower pKa. Why is this? Because the pKa is the negative log of Ka. Moreover, a stronger acid will have a high hydrogen ion concentration or high hydronium concentration. However, the stronger acid will have a lower pH because the pH is the negative log of hydronium ion concentration. Strong acids have higher Ka, lower pKa. Stronger acids have higher hydronium ion concentration, but lower pH. Some famous reactions that you cannot afford to miss on your exam. On many exams, including the MCAT, they give you molecule X reacting with molecule Y, and they expect you to predict the product of this reaction. So here are some doozy tips. From general chemistry, you know that acid plus base equals salt plus water. Never ever forget this. Example, carboxylic acid plus base will give you the salt of the carboxylic acid plus water. Example, 
example, suppose that pentanoic acid reacted with a base, NaOH, sodium hydroxide, what do you get? Well, it's called pentanoic acid. I'll get sodium pentanoate plus water. Also, acid plus base will give me the conjugate base of the acid and the conjugate acid of the base, which means the acid, as it loses the protons, becometh the conjugate base of the acid. And the base, as it acquires that proton, becometh the conjugate acid of the base. As the acid loses its protons, it becomes a negative because the proton that you lost was positive. When you lose the positive, you become a negative conjugated base. Conversely, as the base acquires that proton, it becomes positive because proton is positive. The acid will accept electrons, but the base is an electron donor. When you lose the electrons, when you lose the negativity, you become positive. An important mnemonic to remember forever is that nitrogen is nucleophilic. Why? Because nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons that it can loan and give to others. And when you have a lone pair of electrons that you can give to others, you are a nucleophile by definition. And good nucleophiles are good bases. Strong bases. It's the same mnemonic. Biden again. The base, according to Lewis, is a donor of electrons and is a nucleophile, which is negative. Base, according to Lewis, is a donor of electrons and is nucleophile, which is negative. Important reactions for your exam. When they give you an alcohol and a halogenated acid or hydrogen, halide, a halide is a halogen, by the way, which means group 17 in your periodic table, stuff like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, etc. It's a double substitution reaction. The R will take the X, lump them together, and the H will take the OH and form water. Alcohol plus hydrogen halide will give me alkyl halide plus water. Another gift for your exam that you cannot miss when they give you carboxylic acid plus ammonia, you get amide plus water. I mean, think about it. If I have carboxylic acid with just COOH, COOH, this OH is a leaving group. It will leave the chat to become part of water and in place of the OH, we'll put what? We'll put NH2. Amazing. What's that called? CONH2 is an amide, not an amine because amide has a D which has part of it that looks like an O. That's how I remembered. And M means what? It's like an amino. It has a nitrogen group. But hey, medicosis, ammonia is NH3, but this is just NH2. Yeah, because I took one H and helped made the water. H from here, OH from there, together you get H2O. What's that called? Nucleophilic acyl substitution. Why substitution? Because the nucleophile substituted for the leaving group. And acyl means what? Acyl means a carboxylic acid or a derivative of the carboxylic acid. What are the derivatives of the carboxylic acids? Esters, amides, anhydrides. Another reaction that you should never miss is the fissure esterification. Esterification, making ester from carboxylic acid and alcohol. Carboxylic acid plus an alcohol equals ester plus water. Here's a carboxylic acid. Here's an alcohol. Before you know it, I have an ester, which is COOR plus water. And this happens under acidic conditions. Polarity. What is polarity? Well, like dissolves like. If you are like water, you'll be soluble in water. If you're polar, you'll be soluble in polar solvents. But you'll be insoluble in nonpolar organic solvents, like benzene. How about nonpolar molecules? They are water insoluble, but they are soluble in nonpolar organic solvent such as benzene. When they give you a molecule on your exam and they want you to predict whether it's polar or not, use my trick called the tilt. If you see a tilt, it's polar. If you see no tilt, it means nonpolar. Look at sodium chloride for instance. And I want you to cut it with a knife, just like this. Do you see any difference between the left half and the right half? Of course, one is positive, one is negative. That's a tilt that is polar. But then look at this carbon dioxide. Cut it with a knife, just like this. Is there any difference between the left half and the right half? No, they are identical. There is no tilt whatsoever. No tilt means nonpolar. This is polar and will be soluble in polar solvents like water. This is nonpolar and will be soluble in nonpolar solvents like benzene. This will not be soluble in benzene and this will not be soluble in water. 
And by the way, if you make hydrogen bonds, you're more likely to be polar and water soluble. If you have a tilt, you are polar. Look at this. What's the tilt? It could be positive versus negative, like sodium chloride, or even partially positive and partially negative. Polar ionic, polar covalent. We talked more about this in my general chemistry playlist. Hydrogen bonds can form between hydrogen and one of three molecules. Could be between hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen and nitrogen, or hydrogen and fluorine. How do I remember it? It's ONF, or the UNF mnemonic. Hydrogen bonds, UNF, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Another mnemonic is to write the word hydrogen funny. And instead of A, just write it as if it resembles an F. And now hydrogen can make a bond with oxygen, just like this. Nitrogen, just like this or fluorine, just like that. If you can make hydrogen bonds like alcohols, like carboxylic acids, you will have relatively high boiling point, melting point, and high solubility in water, i.e. polar. Now on the topic of formal charge again. Now here's the technical way to do and calculate the formal charge. You should ignore this and use the simpler version. What I expected minus what I actually found in reality. Let's practice. Carbon. How many bonds do we have around carbon? What do we expect? We expect to have four. Why is this? Because hydrogen has six electrons in total. Two will be in the first shell and four will be in the valence shell. So I expect four valence electrons, which means I expect four bonds. This is what I expected minus what I actually found. One, two, three, four. Four minus four is zero. This carbon atom is neutral and has a formal charge of zero. How about this carbon? Same story. One, two, three, four. I expected four. I found four. So zero. It's also neutral. Now let's look at this carbon. Carbon is still carbon, which means I still expect four valence electrons. Okay, how many bonds do we have here? I have one, two, and three. Four minus three is positive one. So the formal charge here is plus one. Let's try this carbon. How many bonds or how many valence electrons do I expect? Four. How about here? One, two, three, four. Four minus four equals zero. This is neutral. Now, can you find the formal charge for this molecule as a whole? Whole spelled W-H-O-L-E. First, look at the periodic table. I expect oxygen to have what? Eight electrons. So two in the first shell and six electrons in the valence shell. I expect six. That's what I expect from oxygen. Amazing. How about sulfur? Sulfur has 16 electrons, two in the first shell, then eight, that's 10. 10 plus six is 16. Okie dokie, I expect Mr. Sulfur to have six as well. Now let's try this. Look at this oxygen. I expected six valence electrons. How many did I see actually? One, two, three, four, five, and six. 6 minus 6 equals 0. This oxygen does not have any charges. Let's look at this one. I expect 6 because it's an oxygen. How many did I actually see? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 6 minus 7 is negative 1. So this oxygen has a charge of negative 1. How about this oxygen? I expected 6. I found 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. As for this oxygen, I expected 6. I found 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 6 minus 7 is negative 1. So this oxygen has a formal charge of negative 1. How about the sulfur? I expected 6 and I found 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 minus 6 for the sulfur gives me 0. So in total, there is a formal negative 1 charge here and negative 1 charge here. And that's why the formal charge for the entire molecule is negative 2. And that's why you write SO4 2 minus like this. This is where the 2 minus came from. One here and one there. You do not want to miss the next video in this organic chemistry playlist where we'll talk about the IOPAC systematic naming. Quiz time. Is bromine molecule more soluble in water? or more soluble in benzene? Let me know your answer in the comments. You'll find the answer key in my general chemistry playlist. You can download my organic chemistry notes, my general chemistry notes, my biochemistry notes, biology notes, physiology notes, all kinds of notes on my website, medicosisperfectionetics.com. Check out my biochemistry playlist, my general chemistry playlist, and my biology playlist as well. 
If you're studying pharmacology, I have all of the pharmacology courses that you can imagine on my website, such as my general pharmacology course on pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, tons of graphs and math equations. There are more than 300 premium videos only to those who click the join button and choose the highest tier. Smash like, subscribe, hit the bell, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes and cases. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine and chemistry make perfect sense.